All right, now it's time for you guys to hear. We haven't had nearly enough. Have, have you thought about all the speakers? Haven't they been wonderful? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And we're going to keep up with that fabulous tradition. But uh, I wanted you to be aware, especially if you're new to our um, organization, um, we call this our Margaret Noble address, and a lot of people are not familiar with who Margaret Noble is. So we'd like to let you know about it. The Margaret Noble Address is named in honor of one of the founding members of MAPS. The organization came into formal existence, as we know, on Saturday, May 22, 1965, during a meeting of planetarium educators held in the Earth and Space Science Laboratory of Frederick County, Frederick, Maryland. Margaret was a leader in this endeavor. Margaret was a science teacher and planetarium director at Cardoza High School in Washington, D.C. Upon her retirement from D.C., she became planetarium director at Prince George's County Public Schools Spitz A1 facility with a cloth dome. I still have the Spitz A1 hiding somewhere. Um, she successfully lobbied for a new A4 upgrade and eventually was instrumental in raising funds to establish the Owen Science Center planetarium facility where I'm now honored to work. Her particular talents in persuasion, diplomacy, persistence, and her passion for astronomy guided her efforts in bringing the universe to students. Although Margaret projected an image of a genteel, distinguished lady, that was a cloak for the whirlwind of energy and focus that existed within. We remember Margaret as a mentor, an educator, a planetarian, a lobbyist, and a dreamer. Her main goal in life was to inspire children to become interested in astronomy in particular and science in general. She worked tirelessly to realize that vision and pass her love of teaching astronomy to her students and her colleagues. The presenters of the Margaret Noble Address should exhibit similar traits and use this opportunity to share their experience, wisdom, and unique perspectives on the state of planetarium education and its potential for inspiring both students and public audiences to higher aspirations in our time. And I think that we're going to ask Alan to come up and introduce our speaker who more than meets uh, those uh, standards. Alan? Thank you. Yes, many of you already know our speaker for this evening because he's very recently retired and as, as recently as two years ago was a co-host of this very conference. Don Knapp is a longtime member and a pillar of the MAPS organization. He was here holding things up when I arrived, and that's a long time ago. <laughs> He'll deliver the 2013 Margaret Noble Address for us, speaking from a life of planetarium operation leading to his recent retirement. He started in planetariums in 1972 with a BA in astrophysics, much better qualified than I am, from Indiana University. Through the years and his professional positions in four institutions, Don opened the skies to thousands of visitors in museums and school districts and played key roles, very key, very important roles in our own MAPS Fellowship. He is a MAPS Fellow, of course. <laughs> Don has been a member of the International Planetarium Society since 1972, when it was known as the International Society of Planetarium Educators, and today he's a Fellow of that society. He has also been active in the Great Lakes Planetarium Society, the Southeast Planetarium Association, and of course MAPS. Don's a past president of MAPS. He served as editor of the Constellation as well, published the proceedings of our annual meeting, was a member of the executive board, served as chairman of the nominations committee, so he started some of this political nonsense, and started the original MAPS website, founded MAPS L, and co-hosted the 2011 annual conference. He just retired in 2011. He exemplifies all we celebrate in our conference today, leading the charge to educate young minds in public schools with largely live festivals of science and not shying away from new technologies, having worked with media from a Vulex Venus projector of the 70s to a Spitz Psy Dome of the New Millennium more recently, right? His talk, Lost in Space, Now What? will enlighten us with characteristic, light-hearted insights. Oh, well, I, I did write this, actually. <laughs> I was being quite optimistic. I, I thought after a year of retirement, he might have gotten a little better sense of humor. Um, but um, I, I, understand, I understand his wife has discounted any possibility of that. She, she took exception to this. But I'll say it anyway. He will enlighten us, and maybe... Maybe wishful thinking will do this. 
with characteristic light-hearted insights and the richness of his experience. Don, you're on. <laughs>
We had the incandescent light sources for each of the star balls. Uh, and they were, I thought was a beautiful, beautiful star field. Of course, the problems would occur when you have uh, Aldebaran burn out <laughs> in the winter sky. And so you've got everything else except that one star. But uh, nevertheless, it, it worked. And that's the key to uh, anything is, will it work? <laughs> Theater also had two carousel projectors, so we were state of the art. Two carousel projectors. We had 36 single shot slide projectors. It was from Vulex, remember? Uh -huh. And uh, they were basically modified film strip projectors, so that you could have a, a single slide in them. And I used those for constellation outlines. I mean, get blocks of wood and tilt them over at various angles, aim them in different places, and uh, make sure that the sky was in the right place. But uh, it worked. And as I said, I loved it. For a while. I guess I started getting restless. And as a matter of fact, I can trace it to the realization that, uh, gee, I was about to go on tenure. That means I'll be able to be here for the rest of my life <laughs> in the same dome teaching the same courses. <laughs> kind of a little scary. I'd really like to try my hand in museums, if I could. And fortunately, in that time period, jobs did open up occasionally. Six, seven, eight jobs a year. There was a job bank in the Strasbourg Planetarium. You just sent them your uh, uh, self-addressed stamped envelopes as soon as they got an announcement. They'd send it off to you, send in your resume, and Sooner or later, somebody contacted me. And I uh, finally accepted a uh, position at the Schenectady Museum in upstate New York. You know that place. Yeah. 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 Just hosted a conference. Has it changed any? The name has changed. <laughs> I tell you. That was, that was an experience, too. Schenectady uh, Museum had a lot of uh, interesting intrigue in many ways. Being in the planetarium was nice because you got to do what you wanted. You got to uh, give the programs, collect tickets in some cases. But uh, basically, you had full run of the, run of the planetarium. Now, unfortunately, I was there two years when the executive director resigned. And the board, in their wisdom, decided I was going to be the best person to take over as an interim director. Never had museum experience at all. It's the Peter Principle to the yeah. utmost. <laughs> so I, you know, sure, we'll do this. Spent about three months as acting director, and they uh, found a new director. Great. Back under the dome. He was there three months before he was fired. Uh, and that's really when the intrigue started to begin. <laughs> <laughs> because the person who was selected to be interim director in this case had been the board president of the museum. And she was selected because she really had her eyes set on becoming the director of the entire museum. Well, it didn't work out quite right because in order to do that, she had to resign from the board, which was to be found out that the board gave a big sigh of relief that she resigned. <laughs> As announced to her, the board was also interested in not letting her be the permanent director. <laughs> it turned out she alienated uh, much of the staff. Some people left. The rest of us uh, kind of let our, uh, well, we let our views be known that we didn't think she was the proper person for, uh, for the job. And as things turned out, I ended up becoming the executive director of the Schenectady Museum. <laughs> Again, not exactly what I wanted to do, but it did give me the opportunity to see what things are like on the other side of the desk, so to speak. Because I did have to worry about budgets. I did have to worry about staffing. I did have to worry about lots of things that I didn't have to worry about in the plant there. No, that was somebody else's problem. Well, I was there two years as executive director, and I decided I'm not a museum director. I'm a planetarian, and I want to be a planetarian. So I started looking again, found out that uh, there was a new position, a new planetarium opening up in Roanoke, Virginia, at a science museum that uh, was being built. And I was lucky enough to be hired uh, in that position at the Roanoke Valley Science Museum. 
And as all museums do anymore, it has changed its name. It's now the Science Museum of Western Virginia. It may have another name now, I'm not quite sure, because they recently uh, moved and they're building a new facility. But at any rate, I was there for uh, several years before I got my position in, uh, in Centennial School District in uh, Warminster. In that case, I really wasn't looking for another job, but as things turned out, I was asked to look for another job. So I know how that feels, too. And unfortunately, when that occurred, we weren't getting eight or nine job openings a year. Uh, I had to look quite hard before I found the position in, uh, in Centennial. I got there in part uh, because I thought, well, you know, I'll take this three years down the road, find something else, and move. Been there 24 years now. So uh, sometimes you take what's given to you. Now looking back, I think of this time really as kind of the golden years of planetariums, at least for me, because a lot was going on in the planetarium field in the early 70s, 80s. MAPS had formed in 1965, so it was only seven years old when I started. IPS formed in, uh, the seven, in 1970. I became a member in 72, attended the first conference uh, when it was officially uh, called the International Society for Planetary Educators. In those days, it's international met the U.S. and a couple of places in Canada. <laughs> Later on, it became a couple of places maybe in Mexico. But that meant that the meetings were at least close by. And I got to attend quite a few of those early meetings. Unfortunately, lately I haven't been able to uh, go to Egypt or uh, go to Australia. But I would really like to. <laughs> now that I'm retired, maybe I'll be able to. Yeah. We'll see. It still costs money, though, to get to those places. That's a strange thing. But uh, not only was, uh, were organizations being formed, the planetariums themselves were making meetings. Looking back, I can remember that the planetarium that I held at highest esteem was the Strasbourg Planetarium in Rochester, New York, because they really wanted to share their knowledge, their skills, their techniques with others. Up until that time, really, the big planetariums were the big planetariums. You know, they didn't mix with the uh, smaller facilities. Today, of course, that's all changed. As we Wait a minute. I guess we can <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. no. It's changed a little bit. <laughs> but one of the things that uh, I remember about it was that they used to have show kits that would be distributed free of charge in many cases. There were grants that were given to the planetariums to make these shows, distribute them to school planetariums and others, and you could put on a high quality show for pennies. You got slides, all that you needed. You got the script. You got uh, the soundtracks. You even got uh, usually descriptions on how to make special effects because you didn't just go down to the corner drugstore and buy your special effect machine. It was great. And there were some great shows. I still remember the, the old Hanson shows also from uh, Salt Lake City. Programs like Footsteps, probably remember that one. Sky Watchers of ancient Mexico. <coughs> The universe of Dr. Einstein, and uh, of course when Carl Sagan was the rage, there was a planetarium program, uh, Cosmos, made from the old Cosmos show. Uh, Jack Horkheimer had one, uh, what was that, Starbound? I believe that was the name of it. Stargazer. Yeah. And that was full of mobile media effects. Really kind of sh shook things up a bit. But at any rate, you can see that in the 70s and in the 80s, Public interest in the space program was still pretty strong, too. For the most part, there was at least adequate funding for planetariums. There'll never be enough funding for planetariums, unfortunately. And the field was pretty healthy all the way around. Unfortunately, by the end of the 80s, things began to change. And I personally trace the uh, beginning of this to one event, the Challenger disaster. January 28, 1986. For the explosion that took place 73 seconds into the flight, not only took the lives of its seven member crew, it brought an end really to NASA's can do image. It created a doubt within the government and the public at large, I believe, as to the necessity of a manned space program. Coupled with that, 
we've been having uh, space probes to the uh, planets on a regular basis. By 1986, by 89, the Voyagers had passed by Uranus and Neptune. That was winding down. And I think the interest in that even was winding down with the uh, public. And it seems to me that uh, throughout the 90s and into the first decade of the 21st century, well, that's odd to say for me. 21st century, I still can't get used to it. Support for planetariums gradually began to dry up. School planetariums in particular. Many were built during the height of the space race. In the 60s and early 70s, they're getting old, showing their age. The people who were instrumental in seeing that they were built, they weren't there anymore. New administrators were in place with different ideas, different uh, uh, views of what should be and shouldn't be taught. Many school districts chose to simply close the facilities down rather than to uh, repair or replace the aging equipment. Public planetariums had their own problems, particularly those in mid-sized cities. Of course, budget cuts resulted in staff being let go. Museums began to look at planetariums as potential sources of income rather than as part of their educational mission. Many planetariums were expected to offset all of their expenses with income from the admissions they took in. How often does that happen? <laughs> IMAX theaters began to supersede planetariums as a major draw for museums. Jobs began to dry up. To me, that seemed like the decline of the golden age. Now it brings us to today. I think we're a field in transition, obviously. Many facilities, particularly those located in public schools, are in dire straits, hanging on by their, uh, well, fingernails. Many, perhaps most districts, are faced with ever-shrinking budgets, more and more pressure to stick to the basics, have to have a uh, 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 multitude of standardized tests, you have to teach to the core curriculum, which doesn't include a whole lot of astronomy. It appears that things are really going to get worse before they get much better. But they will get better. I have confidence in that as well. And I think evidence of that is the digital revolution that's taking place. Many of the older school planetariums that were deemed to be obsolete, instead of being shut down, are being converted to full dome theaters. Of course, sometimes this is being done with the idea that, well, they're a turnkey operation, and a teacher can go ahead and start the program, and we don't need a planetarium director. But uh, nevertheless, the planetariums are still there. Public planetariums have jumped onto this digital revolution with uh, a zest. It seems like almost every month there's a new full dome theater opening up with the uh, latest cutting edge uh, equipment, slightly better technology than the last, and a kind of keep up with the Joneses is going on with the different planetariums. As an aside, I can remember attending an IPS conference, I think it was in 1980, in Chicago. Adler Planetarium was uh, hosting an event, and we were having a luncheon uh, there. Seated next to me was a woman named Jerry Panic, who brought up the subject of a video-based star projector. Quite frankly, most of us at the table looked at her like, are you crazy? <laughs> can you imagine video on the dome producing the stars? I mean, they'd be fuzzy, they're in black and white. It's not going to work, at least not in my lifetime. Well, she was quite firm in her belief that not only would this happen, but it would revolutionize the field. And three years later, the first Digistar opened up at Science Museum in Virginia in Richmond. I got to see it in action in 1988 when the IPS conference was held there. And I have to admit, the star field was fuzzy. It was monochromatic. You couldn't show full definition images. You couldn't have uh, moving constellation uh, outlines and all their glory like we do today. But it worked. And it improved. And today, well, we know what's happening. She was right. It's taken off. And for good reason. The visitors at today's planetariums are no longer stuck on the surface of the Earth. They can travel to virtually anywhere in the universe, touching a button. <coughs> T 
teaching possibilities are endless. And I think we're really just scratching the surface there. Things that Dave Bradshaw <laughs> does uh, with his side own. Inspiring. The things that uh, I've heard you talking about doing in your own classrooms using digital. It, it's amazing what can be taught with that. And not only that, but you can share what you do much more easily. I can remember again in the old days, someone described planetariums as sort of like being home movies under a dome. Because each one had their own equipment, each one had their own uh, slides, each one had their own thing. And it was like watching a home movie, home uh, slideshow. But now, we can reproduce our programs. We can use bits and pieces that we want in the way we want. And that really, I think, is important. The cost of show production, of course, is uh, kind of out of hand for school planetariums. Although, a lot of the things you want to do in a school lesson, all you need is to be able to access those things that are already in the software. You don't need much money to do that. It's the commercial programs that are expensive. And that uh, the licensing of that is something that uh, really smaller planetariums have to learn how to deal with. But no matter what the future brings, I'm convinced that planetariums in one form or another will somehow survive. And planetariums will be needed to run them. So there will be jobs. There will be fun things to do. Now part of the uh, call to what I should talk about included inspiring folks. So I've come to my wow portion of the talk. <laughs> wow actually stands for words of wisdom. I guess the old, for, old, old person like me uh, has the wisdom to uh, give some thought as to what, uh, what people need to know to survive for 40 years or so. Doesn't matter whether you're in a small inflatable dome, whether you're in a gigantic uh, hybrid system. There are certain skills that you need to develop, produce, and present the content needed under the dome. So the rest of my talk is really just going to be kind of a hodgepodge of ideas, suggestions, and I'll admit in some cases pet peeves about uh, the profession. Let's start with some uh, suggestions. A few basics. Be nice to everybody all the time. No reason to be grumpy. Be nice. Smile. If you're nice to people, people will be nice to you. And that makes things a lot easier. When you need stuff, when you uh, want support, or if you just want to sit down and have a coke together, something like that. Treat everyone with respect. Again, everyone. Not just the administrators who uh, are going to give you your budget. <coughs> Not just the public because they pay to get in to see you. But everybody. Custodians, your lecturers, <coughs> anybody you come into contact. If you respect them, they'll respect you. And to the vendors, be loyal to the vendors that you have. Because they can be your best friends. They do know your equipment probably better than you do. Call them up if you have a problem. Listen to them. Seek their advice. Particularly in the planetarium field, I think, I think the vendors are much more involved than in any other field. They love astronomy as much as we do. Know your detractors. That's important because everybody's going to have detractors. And it's good to know who they are so you can be prepared. This is an interesting thing that I jotted down. Learn to deal with ambiguity. Because it's everywhere. I once saw a job announcement for a museum director in a small museum, and after listing uh, the requirements of you know, budgetary uh, knowledge and working with staff and management, they said, the ability to deal with ambiguity. And I thought that was great. Because, man, I deal with ambiguity every day. You get mixed signals from all over the place. Deal with it. It's hard sometimes, but you can. One tip, if you're dealing with some administrators that are often uh, not fully supported, 
Remember that it's always, or it's not always, it's often more effective to apologize for something that you've already done <laughs> than to seek permission for doing something that you want to do. Uh, not bad advice. Maybe not for the major things, but certainly there are a lot of things you can just do. Chances are nobody's going to need you, or know you even did them. But if they do, oh. I didn't realize I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. I'll try not to do that again. I'll make sure I run by it. I'm not by it. Goodness gracious. Blow your own horn. You don't know what he will. Cultivate the media. And I know this is verboten in lots of school districts. If you want to have something in the press, it's got to go through the proper channels and the administration has to prove it. And well, nowadays it's easy to get around that. There are a lot of uh, news outlets that are looking for information. And if you're telling them about a, an eclipse that's coming up or a, something uh, like that, well, you're not really talking about school business. You're talking about astronomy, something else. But once the editor realizes that you're a source of information, they'll start calling you. And once they start calling you again, well, you can't hang up on the editor of the paper. <laughs> so uh, you better talk to them. When I was in uh, both Schenectady and Roanoke, we got uh, involved with a couple of the radio stations. Usually each year, a couple times a year, you'd be invited to be on one of their talk shows, where probably four people listened. But uh, at least you got the opportunity to sit behind a microphone and do a uh, talk about your love. Nowadays, uh, there are free community papers everywhere. Again, they're looking for news. If you're going to do a public show, evening program, make sure they know about it. Chances are somebody might call you down about it, and you can uh, expound and uh, get support from the community. One excellent source for this now on the uh, web is something called Patch. Are you familiar with that? Yep. I think I saw something in the uh, map cell or something asking about what that was. But basically, uh, it's a, I, I would assume somebody came up with the idea and said, you know, if we get all these small towns, and uh, give them a web page and let them uh, have a template for uh, giving news, we can uh, make some money that way with advertising. Well, virtually every town in our area, at any rate, has their own patch. And again, you let them know about something, they're always wanting news, they put it on the web. And uh, there are people that read those regularly. So cultivate that media. And again, don't forget to thank people who help you. Big on thanks. Sometimes uh, we take people for granted, people that help get the school open for you, get the uh, facility shut down after you leave. Make sure you thank them now and then. Accept criticism with grace. After all, you can just accept the criticism if it's something that you think is valid, or you can ignore it. Don't get upset about it. It's just somebody else's opinion. You're the expert. You've got the degree. You've got the pointer. <laughs> and pick your battles. Pick your battles. That's, that's one of the things I try to do all the time. Learn what's important to fight about. Learn what's important to do anyway and apologize later. And know what's important to uh, dig in your heels or ignore. Now for those of you that work in school planetariums, a couple of things that I found very useful. One of the most important is never refer to your presentations as shows. School planetariums give lessons. I have a lesson on the moon. I have a lesson on the uh, solar system. I have a lesson on super volcanoes. It really goes a long way. It, it makes a difference as far as whether you're a fro over there that's just showing these, uh, these programs, these, these shows, or you're giving lessons. Nowadays, you have to be creative when applying state uh, standards. And for advice on that, I'd suggest talking to Kim Small. I think she is an expert uh, as far as uh, figuring out exactly how to get the uh, standards to meet your needs rather than you have to meet the standards needs. Patty's very good at that, too, and many others. Know your limits, though. Know when to say no, too. Because you'll find this planetarium director, 
people, uh, well, oh, I didn't know there was a planetarium there. Do you do evening programs? Do you do you a lot of scout groups in? And pretty soon you'll be getting requests that, well, the school district says, well, if you want to do it, fine. It's not going to pay you for it, but go ahead. And since you love astronomy, you say, well, I can't turn these kids down. Before long, you spend lots of hours under the dome that uh, maybe you should be spending at home. Now, if you are under the dome, there are some tips, too. My number one rule, cannot overemphasize it, move the pointer slowly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have to give kudos to Sam. In the very opening presentation, the first day, he's shown where the sun is. He used the technique that I always did. Start with the pointer someplace else in the sky. Let them see where it is, and then slowly move it to where you want them to concentrate. Don't just go, there it is, turn it off, and keep talking. Or over here we have, they don't know where over here is until they find your pointer. So move that pointer slowly. <sighs> <laughs> Similarly, try to make slow, smooth transitions from one scene to another. That's not always easy, but uh, try not to run the sky backwards. That's another my pet peeves. Try to at least keep things moving in the right direction. Try to be as accurate as you can, but don't go overboard with it either. I'll get to that in a moment. Please, always use a microphone. Mm -hmm. I know we had a lot of people that today said, oh, I don't think I need a mic because I have to stand behind the lecture and so forth. And in many cases, that's true. But unfortunately, in a lot of cases, that's not true. I mean, it may not be that you can't hear in the back, but maybe uh, you have to strain a little bit. Maybe if somebody next to you is talking to the person next to them, you, you miss something. Particularly important if uh, you're giving a public program and there's somebody like me in the back, some old guy who has trouble hearing in the first place, and so he's not going to catch what you're saying. And it's not hard. They've got clip-on mics. They've got mics that go around your face. You've got wireless mics. You've got handheld mics. Get used to using a mic. It's not that hard. Come on, you're professionals. Know your audience. Know who you're talking to. Have an idea of what they know about you or about the sky. Certainly give different programs to elementary students than high school students. Yeah. But basically, I found that there are four, four topics in astronomy that you give, you talk about. You talk about the moon, talk about the constellation, talk about the solar system, talk about the universe. Now, you may talk a little differently to a college level class in astronomy versus a third grade class in astronomy, but it's still the same stuff. Just use different words, different ways to describe things. Oh, I haven't said so yet. Move the pointer slowly. <laughs> Very important. Okay. Move that slowly. When answering a question or trying to describe something, remember, keep this in the back of your mind. Some people will think this is heresy. But sometimes a few seconds of inaccuracy is worth an hour of explanation. I know we want to be accurate. I know we want to uh, get the information across as accurately as we can. But there are times, and in Dave uh, Bradstreet's talk, a couple times he would say, well, it's close enough. And it is close enough. You don't always have to be precise there. Remember your audience. It's a second grade class. If you describe a black hole, incorrectly, well, it's not going to affect them a whole lot. <laughs> and in fact, sometimes good enough is good enough. I mean, I know we want to shoot for the, uh, the best we can do, but sometimes you have to settle for good enough. If you're producing the program, if you've got the uh, lesson in mind, try to get the best, but if you can't quite get there, and it still works, Good enough. For the best tool is the simplest one that works. Simplest one that works. We had a problem with the uh, equipment at uh, yesterday evenings about the moon. 
that example. Well, in your own theater, you'd have a plan B. You'd reach back and you'd find your uh, styrofoam moon ball, stick, get some of that flashlight, and you'd continue. That would be good enough in that case, because that simple tool is as effective in many cases as, as the fancy ones on the dome. And in fact, it doesn't matter what technique you use. What matters is how effective it is. And that's something that sometimes I think we forget. We think that our way is the best way. And if somebody isn't doing it our way, well, they can't be as good as mine. They can't be getting the, the information across. But you know, there are lots of ways to do something right. Lots of ways to do something wrong, too. So you've got to be careful. Yeah. <laughs> but nevertheless, do what you're comfortable doing. Do what you're comfortable doing. And be enthusiastic. Like Phil was pointing out, have a passion. We wouldn't be doing this if we didn't. Show it. Have fun while you're doing it. Oh, move the pointer slowly. <laughs> move it slowly. Bugs the heck out of me. Finally, just a couple of comments about our profession as a whole. You're the expert. Under that dome, you are the master of the universe. Act like it. If somebody asks you something you don't know, say you don't know. That's all right. Say you can find it on the internet. Look it up. It's a good assignment for you. I don't know how many miles it is to Pluto right now. Don't need to. But if you really, 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 really wanted to, you could find out easy enough. There's some things you should know, though. You need to know the constellations. If you're working in the planetarium, know the constellations. Be able to point out Pegasus. Be able to find Virgo. Be able to identify some objects like the Pleiades, the Orion Nebula. Know that Alberio is a double star. These are things that are important. Know what's visible in the night sky. This is something I've realized being retired, I said, I don't pay attention as much anymore. I used to know what phase the moon was in through the day. I used to uh, know what planet was where, when. But now, I don't even get to see the stars much. <laughs> it's one of the things I miss most about being retired. Going into that dark room, turning on the stars, <sighs> just taking it all in. But now I find that you have to wait till it gets dark to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and chances are it's cloudy, <laughs> or hot, or cold. There are a lot of advantages to being under the dome. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> know your institution's history. If it's a brand new institution, fine. Know who helped build it and why. If it's an older institution, like many of the schools, know why it was built in the first place. Who was the first director? Do you know that? <coughs> Be active in the profession. Attend conferences like this. Share your knowledge. Give a paper presentation. We're not going to bite. We have questions. We have other ideas that we might want to share back at you. But we want to know what you're doing. Because as you all know, we work in a vacuum. We're in this little dome, no windows. Most people don't even know we're there, unless they're bringing a class in or taking a class out. They have no idea what we do. That's the other thing. Which is a good thing. <laughs> Not bad at all. Make sure your membership in MAPS is up to date. <laughs> Join the International Planetarium Society. I know it's international, what do I want to join a group like that for? They're just as down to earth as us. It's amazing. If you do have an opportunity to go to a conference, you will meet some very interesting people. And the next time you see them, whether it's two years later or eight years later, they'll remember you and you remember them. It's like a family, as again Patty has pointed out. Follow Maps L and Dome L on the internet. Sometimes there's some uh, uh, 
uh, not so interesting posts. But other times there's some really good information that you, uh, you can get from that. And it's not that hard to, uh, to follow. Subscribe to and read one or more astronomy magazines. I personally like Sky and Telescope. I've been subscribing since, gosh, 1968, I guess. I had subscribed to astronomy for a while, but I just preferred what I knew best, Sky and Tell. And lately I've been subscribing to uh, a UK publication, Astronomy Now, which I think is excellent. Unfortunately, because it's being shipped overseas, it's expensive, but now you can get it online. Yeah, you can subscribe to it as a magazine for the price that you would normally pay in Great Britain, as opposed to having to worry about them shipping it over here. So I'm going to be doing that in the future. Build up your professional library. All these things sound like very basic things, but they're important. Man, you can't get me in a book server that I'm not finding the astronomy department. And I've been not under the dome for quite some time. And one of the best places to look in there, the children's section. Mm -hmm. I learned how to explain things by going to the children's section and looking at children's books. Great resource. And here's one. Join and participate in the Museum Alliance. How many of you are familiar with the Museum Alliance? Oh, good, a goodly number. Those of you who are not familiar, it's actually a, uh, a service that is uh, presented. NASA is involved, JPL, but you, uh, it's aimed at informal science education. It's aimed at museums, science centers, planetariums. The neat thing is planetariums don't have to be in public museums. They can be school planetariums. If you give a show once every five years to the public, you're a planetarium. And they have regular teleconferences that they will send out to the lift. So you have to sign up. You've got a password for it and everything. In some cases, uh, after you get the material, it's embargoed for another week or so because it hasn't been released to the press. You get access to images that aren't available except to people in the uh, Alliance. And everything is archived. So if you're not able to listen live to the uh, presentation, and they generally announce it a couple of weeks in advance, they tell you the password you need to use, they tell you that uh, there'll be items to download, usually a PowerPoint presentation, so you can follow along when the uh, principal investigator is talking about it. And it's two ways. You can ask questions as well. So it's really fantastic. And school planetariums, you can get uh, credit for it. Mm -hmm. At least, depending upon your school district. I know I got uh, continuing education credit for participating in those. Mm -hmm. All you gotta do is sit down and listen if you want to. Go back and listen to one that's already been recorded. Or participate very actively. Very interesting stuff. Oh, move the pointer slowly. <laughs> okay. Well, that's really about all I have to say, except one last thing. Have fun. You have the greatest job in the universe. Enjoy it. <laughs>